Biden orders Israel to agree to a 21-day ceasefire in Lebanon, but Netanyahu says no. Instead, Netanyahu orders the IDF to decapitate the entire Hezbollah leadership and assassinate Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the head of Hezbollah. Now, Iran has fired nearly 200 missiles at Israel. Biden again is demanding Israel to de-escalate and to agree to a ceasefire. Will Netanyahu defy Biden again? If so, will Biden cut off American weapons to Israel? I sit down with Michael Oren, the former Israeli ambassador to the United States and a former senior advisor to Netanyahu to get the inside story. All this and more tonight on the Rosenberg Report. A very dark and dangerous week. Israel and the Iranian regime going head to head in the most dangerous and explosive fighting of this war so far. Why? Because the Iranian regime has decided to put all its cards, all its chips um, on attacking, retaliating for Israel's tremendously successful uh, uh, decapitation strike against Iran's main terror proxy ally, Hezbollah in Lebanon. Israel has been incredibly successful. We're going to uh, explain all that in a moment. But first, as we set up the show for tonight, you just have to understand, as I'm here in Washington right now, I, I wish I was back in Jerusalem. I wish I was with my people uh, covering this from Israel. But I'm on a month-long speaking tour with my wife, traveling all over uh, the United States, uh, briefing evangelical leaders and lay people on what's happening in Israel, Iran, Lebanon, uh, Gaza and throughout the rest of the region. Um, and it's been important uh, doing that for All Israel News, doing that for the Joshua Fund and so forth, and of course for the Rosenberg Report. Um, but I'm in Washington today as, as, uh, and, and this week as this uh, 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 new crisis, new uh, element of the crisis erupted on Tuesday. So we're gonna start walking you through what's happened and the reactions of different players over the last few days. But this is a very, very dangerous and, and, uh, and very, very challenging week. I'm gonna ask you right up front, I need you to be praying more than ever before and uh, sharing this uh, program on social media with family and friends, uh, educating them, mobilizing them to pray because this is, um, this is gonna get darker, I think, and it's gonna get more difficult uh, as we go ahead, but I believe Israel has the advantage. It, ha it now has the momentum, uh, but it is, a very, uh, it is a very dangerous moment, and there's a tremendous pressure from the Biden-Harris administration that Israel should stand down. But Netanyahu did not follow President Biden or Vice President Harris's counsel or that of uh, French President uh, Emmanuel Macron or the other world leaders that were demanding that Israel accept a ceasefire. Instead, Netanyahu decided to go for the jugular. He gave a defiant speech at the UN. He said that we're gonna, Israel's gonna fight to win. He's gonna take the fight to the enemy even harder than ever before. That there's a biblical choice for the world and for the region between blessings, if the American, Israeli, peaceful, moderate, Sunni, Arab vision of the region prevails, or it's a, a future of curses if the Iranian uh, terror regime's vision is allowed to prevail in the Middle East. It was quite a striking speech. And then moments later, Netanyahu authorized Israel's air force to bomb Hezbollah compound headquarters in broad daylight in downtown Beirut, 60 feet underground. And Netanyahu and the Israelis decapitated the uh, Hezbollah terror regime not only killing Sheikh Hassan Nasrallah, the 32-year veteran of, uh, as a leader of Hezbollah, but also in recent days has killed 18 of the top 18 uh, Hezbollah terror leaders. And that defiance of the President of the United States to defend the Israeli people and our freedom and our security and our way of life, that's leadership. There's been a lot of criticism of Netanyahu. Some of it is justified, but not all of it. But Netanyahu took, took the test, as it were, and passed with flying colors last week. And now it's another test. Biden is gonna put a lot of pressure on Netanyahu not to respond strongly. My instinct is, my bet would be, I'm not a betting man, but I believe Netanyahu is going to 
uh, have full uh, authority and, and uh, unanimity within the Israeli government and military establishment to hit Iran and hit it hard. I'm going to quote from Israel's new ambassador to the United Nations, Danny Danone, who's a friend of mine. He writes, Iran has now launched an attack against Israel. We are ready and prepared defensively and offensively. We will take all necessary measures to protect the citizens of Israel, as we have previously made clear to the international community, any enemy that attacks Israel should expect a severe response. Welcome back to the Rosenberg Report as we continue to walk you through what's happening, why it matters, uh, and how Christians should be praying in this incredibly uh, difficult week. Of course, uh, you know, about a week and a half ago, uh, big and, and, and dramatic uh, developments and uh, very exciting ones as Israel took out uh, the top 18 terrorist leaders inside the Hezbollah terrorist organization, including Sheikh Nasrallah in Beirut. But now, the situation has turned uh, where the Iranian regime has decided uh, to uh, sort of not only to retaliate, but to engage Israel head to head. I want to walk you through some more of some of the key sound bites from key leaders and some of the, and, and more of, of the drama that's been folding uh, over the last few days. The longest response I've seen at the moment uh, on uh, that I that that is an, is a heartening response, the type of response that you expect to hear from an American official, an American leader, is from uh, Senator Lindsey Graham, the uh, Republican from South Carolina. And I just want to read you what he said. He just put this statement out on on X, and it's powerful. Okay, and it should be what the White House is saying. It should be what President Biden and Vice President Harris are saying, but they're not yet. And it, uh, and I'm not holding my breath, but Senator Lindsey Graham says this, this is a moment of choosing for the free world regarding Iran. The Ayatollah and Iranian regime are religious Nazis who want to destroy the state of Israel. Their words, not mine. That's interesting that uh, uh, Graham makes that point. Continuing with Graham's uh, statement on X, they, the Ayatollah and the Iranian regime, want to purify Islam and attack the United States again their words, not mine. Still quoting from Graham, but he's quoting from Iranian leaders over the years. This missile attack against Israel should be the breaking point. And I would urge the Biden administration to coordinate an overwhelming response with Israel, starting with Iran's ability to refine oil. These oil refineries need to be hit and hit hard because that is the source of cash for the regime to perpetrate their terror. Uh, Senator Graham concludes his statement on X with, my prayers are with the people of Israel and may God continue to bless Israel. This is leadership. This is the type of moral authority that you'd expect from every American leader. And look, let's hope that uh, the, the White House, the State Department, the Pentagon get their act together and realize this is not a time to be constraining an ally in defense of itself. Israel's a small country. We're being attacked from seven sides. The Biden team is telling us, and has been for the last week, agree to a ceasefire, a ceasefire. You need a 21-day ceasefire. Stop um, escalating the situation uh, in the Middle East. Escalating the situation? Seriously? We've been attacked in Israel for 361 days so far. We've got 101 hostages still in Gaza being held by terrorists. We've been attacked by 10,000 missiles just from Hezbollah in Lebanon. And now we're under attack by hundreds and hundreds of Iranian missiles. One more, and that is the UN Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, who has shown himself to be anti-Israel in almost in, in, in every possible statement and action that he has made over the past year since October 7th. I mean, really stunningly anti-Semitic, anti-Israel, Unbelievable. So today, with Israel under attack by hundreds of Iranian missiles, Guterres goes on X and puts out this statement. I condemn the broadening of the Middle East conflict with escalation after escalation. This must stop. We absolutely need a ceasefire. Did you hear a word that was missing from that statement by Guterres? Iran. That was, that's a word that's missing. Hezbollah, that's a word that was missing. Terrorism, 
another word missing. Genocidal enemies, putting Israel at existential threat. All words and phrases and sentences completely missing from the statement by the UN Secretary of General. I mean, this is moral bankruptcy at its worst, and this is a test. We cannot, as Israelis, allow the world to dictate how we defend ourselves. Joining me now from New York City to discuss this dramatic and historic week still unfolding with a lot of twists and turns is Michael Oren, the historian, the New York Times bestselling author, former Israeli ambassador to the United States, former member of Knesset, and a senior advisor in days gone by to Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Ambassador, thank you so much for coming on the Rosenberg Report. Let me just start with, uh, talk about the psychology of, you know, we might say, you know, in Hebrew, chutzpah, of Prime Minister Netanyahu being told by President Biden, by French President Macron, the whole, you know, the world leadership, you know, take us, you know, in, they sort of insisted on a 21-day ceasefire, and Netanyahu went the opposite direction and went for the jugular with Hezbollah. Uh, uh, talk about how you see that in terms, and because it, it seems like it's been a game-changing week uh, for Israel. Uh, good to be with you, Joel. It's a game changer, but it, it, this is pretty much the game that we've been playing since October 7th. Uh, keep in mind that the official position of the Biden administration is that the war has to end now. The official position of the French is that the war has to end now, that they were talking about the war uh, in Gaza. They insisted that, that Israeli forces don't enter Rafah in the southern part of the Gaza Strip. We had to go and enter Rafah. They insisted that Israel basically except to sit under Hezbollah fire every day in the north um, until we run out of interceptors and die. Uh, the, this is not a new game. And so in this in course of this entire war, we've had to say to our American allies and to our European allies as well, uh, sorry, uh, we refuse to die. Uh, and sorry, uh, the Jewish people have, are no longer in a situation where people, we're going to let people kill us with impunity and we're going to strike back. And we're sorry if you're in an election year. Um, really, we, we can commiserate, but we're, we just cannot, we cannot uh, hold our fire. And a 21-day uh, ceasefire with Hezbollah serves only one party, and that's Hezbollah. Yeah, especially since the statement that was put out by Biden, Macron, and the others didn't even mention Hezbollah. I mean, the level of, of, of uh, you know, disconnect from reality was amazing. Um, so, all right, so let's talk about what actually, actually happened on Friday, uh, September 27th, because, um, because Israel took out the top Hezbollah leader, uh, the 18th of 18 top Hezbollah leaders, uh, Hezbollah leaders over the last few weeks. Um, and they took Nasrallah out in downtown Beirut in broad daylight with 80 tons of weapons. I mean, I can't really think of, but you help me, you're the historian, another moment of such uh, intelligence and military precision in, uh, certainly we haven't seen it in, in this war. Well, not in this war, but you can go back to wars, uh, June 5th, 1967, when over the course of a, less than two hours, uh, the Israeli Air Force destroyed almost the entire Egyptian Air Force, then proceeded to destroy the Air Forces of Jordan and Syria as well. Uh, so it's that type of brilliant combination of, uh, of technological and intelligence prowess with, with simply you know, good piloting, very good piloting, good bombing. Yeah. I think what was significant about the Nasrallah operation was that the, the timing, the synchronization of the bombing was such that uh, our aircraft, which, you know, which are small aircraft, they're F-15s, uh, F-35s, they're not strategic bombers, uh, and these are planes with a, a limited payload and limited range, were able to basically blast their way through 60 feet of concrete. Now that's a message that has to be internalized by the Iranians who think that their nuclear program is immune to Israeli bombing because we don't have strategic bombers. Uh, guess what? No. Yeah, it's amazing. I, so, uh, you know, you're obviously on the Rosenberg Report, which is on TBN, the most watched Christian television network in the United States. Uh, you know, I, I absolutely believe as a dual U.S.-Israeli citizen in the ingenuity, the creativity, the, the brilliance and courage of, of, of Israel's um, intelligence and military. But this, what, what we've watched over the last two months, really starting with the, the assassinate, uh, assassinations of uh, Mohammed Def in Gaza, uh, Fouad Shukra in Beirut, um, and then, of course, Ismail Haniyeh in Tehran, 
uh, feels biblical. It, you know, it feels like uh, the God of Israel has decided uh, to help in a way that I think a lot of us were feeling like, even as evangelicals, that this was a tough, this is a brutal year. Um, but it, we, we seem to have uh, the wind at our back at the moment. Your thoughts? Well, true. Listen, I, I, as, as many of your viewers, I too am a believer. And, uh, and I believe that uh, you know, Israel exists for a reason. I think the Jewish people exist for a reason. We are here after 4,000 years for a reason. And I think maybe the reason here is that we can show the world, and certainly the Western world, that uh, we can fight back at a time when uh, the West seems increasingly reluctant to even fight for its own security. Can we broaden out this for a moment and talk about the contrast between the massive and catastrophic intelligence failure of Israel on October 7th and what we've watched over the last two months are, uh, you know, uh, among the best uh, uh, intelligence moments in Israel's history, especially coming off of our heels, right? Coming off of the, the grief and the, and the trauma um, of the first many, many months where, uh, you, know, with, you know, yes, we got some, a number of hostages out and this was great, but, it, but Israelis, especially with the murder, the execution of six Israeli hostages just a couple months ago, were, we were grieving so much. We were so... Uh, we've been hit so hard that we, we've got a sharp contrast here. How, how do you account for it? I, I can't entirely. I don't think anybody's going to be able to until there's a, an official investigation and an inquiry uh, to the failures of October 7th. The best I can tell you, Joel, was that uh, after the 2006 Second Lebanon War, uh, the Israeli intelligence community, the Israeli uh, security establishment generally was very much focused on Hezbollah that Hezbollah was a strategic threat to the state of Israel with between 150 and 200,000 uh, rockets and missiles and mortars in its arsenal uh, with cyber capabilities. Uh, its links, of course, to Iran, but not just to Iran, through Iran, to Russia, to China, to North Korea, uh, a, strategic, uh, a strategic threat that could target all of our vital infrastructures, our utilities, our electrical guild, uh, grids, e even Demona. Um, Hamas was perceived as a tactical threat. Um, really, it's kind of right. a new, like a nuisance almost. Um, and I think there was a tremendous amount of disparagement and underestimation of Hamas's capabilities, of certainly of its savagery, uh, on the part of uh, Israeli decision makers generally, and certainly in, in the security establishment specifically. Um, and, and there's going to be a lot to be answered for for those failures on October 7th. But now I think we have shown uh, our own people and the world, um, the old Israel, the Israel we, we always knew and loved and respected, and that we're still there and capable of, of, of performing acts of, uh, of military uh, ingenuity military and, and certainly um, bravery um, for which Israel has uh, quite deservedly uh, gained a, a global reputation. Yeah, absolutely. The extraordinary story, which some people have said, wow, Joel, it reads like one of your political thrillers, except I, I would, you know, the idea of, of wiring 4,000 pagers with explosives. I never had the creativity for that. I'm not sure if anyone would have believed it if it was in a political thriller and then knock people off of their uh, pagers to start using walkie-talkies and many of those being wired. Um, so what, you, what they've done is taken out uh, 4,000 or so mid-level uh, Hezbollah commanders and operatives who don't want to touch anything electronic and, you know, how do they reach them? So, so but this is sending a message. So I'm, I'm more interested from you on, yeah, how does the rest of the region see us, especially our Abraham Accords allies, um, as well as the Saudis? Because, you know, for much of this year, it was like they were having to assess, was their bet correct? And their bet had been, we want to be with the winning team, and we're not sure the U.S. is going to stick in the Middle East, but we can always count on the Israelis to be strong and decisive. And that got rattled this year. Well, I think you gave me my answer already, uh, and it's this. Uh, when I first heard about the operation against uh, Hassan Nasrallah, I turned to the person next to me and I said, well, we just got peace with Saudi Arabia. Mm. Now, the, the, signatory, oh, wow. the signatories to the Abraham Accords didn't sign these agreements because they love us, Joel. Like, they don't wake up in the morning and sing Hatikva. They, they, they signed these accords with us because, because we are strong, because uh, these governments, the Arab governments, are facing twin existential threats uh, from Sunni extremism in the form of ISIS, Al-Qaeda, the Muslim Brotherhood, Hamas, uh, and uh, Shiite extremism in the form of Iran and Hezbollah. And there's only one country in the world, not the United States, that's standing up to both of them, and that's us. And it has been clear to me since October 7th that if we prevailed in this war, we would get peace. It's just the opposite of what other people think, that, that by waging war, uh, somehow we're going to jeopardize the peace. No, 
by raising more successfully to the end, we'll actually be we'll able to broaden and strengthen uh, those Abraham Accords to include Saudi Arabia and other countries uh, as well. You know, uh, John Lennon somewhere is going to hate me saying this, but here, if you want peace, you got to give war a chance. <laughs> yeah, I, I, well, there, there's been a, the, a concept in the West, certainly in the U.S. government for a long time, which is that uh, you negotiate your way forward, but, but actual military victory seems like something uh, of the 20th century concept, not 21st century thinking. And, and I think even, you know, again, with respect to Prime Minister Netanyahu, he really believed that Hamas in Gaza uh, and I, not him alone, uh, you know, the entire senior military and, and intelligence establishment, that, that Hamas in Gaza was a, a, a tension to be managed, uh, to use management uh, yes. thinking, not a problem to be solved. And I remember a few years back, right, Avigdor Lieberman and uh, 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 Naftali Bennett really pushing, we've got to, if we're going to deal with this, we've got to really deal with this. And, but there was no appetite, not just in the prime minister's office, but in the country for a full-on invasion and all that's happened. But one of the things that has gotten missed this week is that uh, the defense minister, Gallant, just basically said, we have just won over Hamas. Yes, there's mop-up operations. It will take some time to fully secure Gaza, but that's a big moment. And then the, uh, the, the uh, decapitation strikes against Hezbollah um, have changed the dynamic in the region. How do you think it's being seen in Tehran? I think Iran understands that it lost one of its major assets in the Middle East, Hamas. It's about to lose a second major asset in the Middle East, Hezbollah. It's an even bigger asset. And that uh, at Free Iran, this is actually, and its regime, this is actually an existential moment. Now, they have a lot of opponents at home. A lot of people hate this regime. And if they yeah, smell yeah. weakness, if they perceive weakness on the part of the regime, there could be an uprising in Iran, and the Ayatollahs could be overthrown. Um, wouldn't that be nice? So uh, it, we've got about a minute left. Talk about U U.S.-Israel relations right now. What do you think uh, Vice President Harris is taking from this? Uh, and what do you think Donald Trump is taking from this? And, and uh, because who becomes the next president of the United States, uh, there may be very different approaches to uh, a very intense ongoing war um, come January. Well, you have this rather anomalous situation where you have two candidates, uh, Kamala Harris and Donald Trump, who both called for the end of the war. They call for the end of the war in different ways. Right. Uh, Kamala Harris through negotiations, hostage release, uh, ceasefires, and uh, Donald Trump by, by letting Israel continue the war and letting it defeat its enemies. I think most Israelis would have preferred the first option if it was truly option, optional. The second option obviously would be the one we choose because we have no choice. Uh, this is a war for our survival. And to the degree to which the United States would be behind us and the degree to which the United States would project its power, that would be very, very helpful. It's yeah. an inflection point. We used to always be very proud that yeah. support for the state of Israel was the, the only truly bipartisan issue in uh, Washington. It's far less so now. We don't like it, but that is the reality. We have to deal with it. And we do expect the United States under this administration to stand four square beside us and let the Iranians and our enemy, our common enemies know that the United States, not just Israel, is willing to extract a prohibitive price for them should they attack the state of Israel. Amen. I hope that uh, both uh, presidential candidates draw a lesson. Uh, when you're strong, use your strength. And, uh, and I think for the United States, both uh, we need a bipartisan uh, solidarity message, which is Israel, finish the job. And we're with you. Uh, Michael Kevin. Oren, thank you so thank much you, for being with us on the Rosenberg Report. Uh, stay safe. May your family stay safe. And uh, I'll be back in Israel soon. I'm looking forward to seeing you. Thank you, you for all you're doing Bye, to, uh, to get the word out. Well, that's our show for this week. Uh, obviously, things are uh, moving fast. Uh, there's a lot we couldn't cover tonight. Uh, a lot that we'll cover on YouTube, but as well as at allisrael.com. All Israel News is the place from moment to moment um, coverage of this war. Uh, I'll continue reporting from Washington and then I'll be traveling around the country. Um, uh, I haven't yet made the decision to go back to Israel yet. I'm supposed to be here for another several weeks of speaking. At the moment, I'm going to keep doing that. Uh, a lot of Israelis, of course, are living in bomb shelters. Uh, the, the airport isn't closed as I say this, but, um, but most airlines have shut down. So I need you to keep praying for Israel, uh, for protection and for total victory over Israel's enemies. Uh, and of course, the, the, the immediate release of every hostage. We need miraculous assistance by the God of Israel. And I have no doubt uh, that he is with us 
and that we will see uh, great success uh, and great achievements and ultimately real victory. Um, I believe that, and I need you to believe that as well, based on the, the teachings and the prophecies of the Bible. We can take that uh, into, uh, we, can, we, can, we can be assured of that. Israel will not be wiped out. We say it's an existential threat because that's what our enemies are trying to do. They're trying to wipe us out, but it, that won't happen. But we have to fight, we have to fight hard, and we need God on our side. And we also need to be praying, of course, for every Israeli, Palestinian, Lebanese person, uh, Iranians as well. Uh, civilians who are being traumatized by this horrific war. And uh, there doesn't seem to be an end in sight yet, but let's pray for true and complete victory, safety, security uh, coming soon. Thank you so much for watching the show. Thank you so much for praying. Thank you so much for giving financially to the Joshua Fund as we continue to provide emergency assistance uh, uh, through the local believers in Israel and among the Palestinians and in, uh, neighboring countries, including in Lebanon and Syria. Uh, I'm really grateful that you watched. God bless you. This is Joel Rosenberg in Washington, D.C. for the Rosenberg Report. I'll see you next week right here on the Rosenberg Report on TVF.